Hi, I'm Dr. Jim Schultz, pastor of Lighthouse Assembly of God, coming to you from my office in Brookings, Oregon. Our church is not going to be able to meet for the time being because of this whole COVID-19 quarantine situation. But until then, we're going to bring you the word and, and an opportunity to pray together uh, via these sort of online chats. And we'll upload a couple of these a week, one on Wednesdays and one on Sundays, uh, so that we can stay in the word and prayer together. A woman worried for 40 years that she was going to die of cancer. When her day finally did come to pass away, she was 70 and she died of pneumonia. It was like she was walking around on a nice day with an umbrella just in case it rained instead of just enjoying the sunshine. Worry is as useless as ejection seats on a helicopter. Yet we're all in this worldwide pandemic situation with the coronavirus. Am I going to get the virus? Is someone in my family going to get this virus? Uh, and if, if we do, will we die of it? Or will we be able to get medical treatment? Will there be immunizations made available that will prevent the spread of this virus? How about the economic impact? Um, some of us are, you know, some of you may have been losing work hours. Maybe you've even lost your job. All of our livelihoods are sort of in question with this. And of course, the stock market is going all over the place. And uh, there's worry about whether we're going to have retirement funds and all of these, all of these worries about bad things that could happen to us. They're very real to us right now. But what are we supposed to do about bad things that might happen to us in the future? Well, let's start with what not to do. Let's not worry, okay? We're going to take a look at some scripture, and I keep looking over here to the left because I've got my outline, my little sermon outline. Um, we shouldn't worry. And let's, let's gain some wisdom from Philippians 4 here. 4, 6, reading from the NIV, Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything. When he says, don't be anxious, he's saying, don't be unduly concerned about anything. Uh, worry and anxiety is like that churning in your guts. It, it's like crying over milk that hasn't even spilled. Um, and Paul seems to clearly be recalling Jesus' teachings on worry back from Luke 12, 22 to 34. So, uh, because he's building on Jesus and what he said, we're going to go ahead and read the Luke passage together. Luke 12, 22 to 34. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs after all these things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what's the problem with worry according to Jesus? Well, first, it doesn't work. Worry is as useless as a concrete parachute. It doesn't add any time to your life. In fact, it may take a little something away from you. Why waste your time on what's not going to actually gain you anything? It also underestimates how valuable we are to God. 
Each of us is made in God's image and likeness, which means that God created us to be his royal sons and daughters, put us in charge of the world to take care of it and um, to see that it is run justly in a way that leads to the flourishing of not only all human beings, but all animal life and, and the created order itself. So charged with this incredible responsibility, we are also accorded this high honor of being made in God's own image and likeness. So if what is put under our feet, the animals, are valuable to God, how much more valuable are we to God that he created to be in charge of the animals and to be his very sons and daughters? Don't underestimate just how much God values you. And so because of that, Jesus speaks of the father taking care of his children. Worry also gives in to fear, okay? Do you admire people who are too afraid to act in the face of a crisis situation or danger? No, we admire people who are courageous. The courageous are not people who are simply not feeling fear, okay? You can be courageous but feel fear. In fact, courage seems to be the, the willingness and ability to act in a situation when we are afraid. So we can't let fear control us and cause us to do things that are counterproductive, destructive, or simply be paralyzed in fear and kept from doing anything positive at all. Um, worry also shows little faith. We're gonna talk a little bit more about faith in a few minutes. Uh, worry comes from setting our hearts on the less important things of life rather than the more important things. So, like, let's say that you have not put God first in your life. If you're not, if God isn't first in your life, if he's not on the throne, the number one most important consideration to you, well, I can guarantee something is, and it's either you are the most important thing to yourself. I'm, we live in a world that thinks putting yourself number one is actually a good thing. That's hedonism, materialism, you know, all this sort of thing. Or maybe we put some other God in his place, but, you know, or maybe our God is pleasure or money or fame or possessions. Those are idols in that case. And some of those, I mean, a lot of those are, are they can be decent things. Possessions, God allows us to have possessions. But if you put possessions first ahead of God, well, now that's a problem. And if you put possessions ahead of your family, oof, you're going to be lonely and miserable. So our loves have to be properly ordered. We must love most what is most worthy of love and love least what is most, what is least worthy of love and only use that which is not worthy of love. So use things, love persons, and don't flip those two things around. We've got to have our priorities straight. But if your priorities aren't straight and your whole thing is possessions and p pleasures and all these things, um, then with a virus going around the world that threatens your life, threatens your livelihood, now all of a sudden your pleasures and possessions and money are threatened. And it's understandable that you would worry because those are the most important things to you. But if God is the most important thing to you, then threats to those lesser things are not quite as earth-shattering to you, okay? Um, <clears throat> worry also drains your joy. Corrie Ten Boom survived a Nazi concentration camp, and she said this, Worry does not empty tomorrow of sorrows. It empties today of strength. Now, Scripture teaches us that the joy of the Lord is your strength. So if you're going through this whole coronavirus thing, um, worried instead of experiencing joy, um, well, you may not have the strength to get through this um, without, again, it's going to be more earth shattering to you internally. Well, so if worry is not what to do, then what should we do in the face of potential bad things that could happen to us? Well, 
Instead, pray. Now, that, that's got to be the most Captain Obvious thing you've ever heard out of a preacher's mouth in your life, right? Instead, pray. But that's just what Paul's talking about here in Philippians 4, 6. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, every situation, even coronavirus situations, even epidemics, well, the guy who said this, Paul, I mean, he was writing to a church that when he established that church, Philippi, you can read this in Acts 17, he was getting persecuted. He got thrown in jail with his buddy Silas. Uncertain of what was going to happen to him. Was he going to be whipped and beaten and die? And I mean, what was going to happen to him? He sang songs at the top of his lungs and he prayed to the Lord and gave thanks to God through that whole situation. God delivered him in that case. Of course, it didn't work out that way in the end with Nero in the mid-60s AD, but nevertheless, Paul was a prayer rather than a worrier. So he says, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. There are all kinds of things to petition God about. I, I mean, take all those things that we're tempted to worry about and pray about them instead. If we're worried about getting the, the you know, COVID-19, pray that you don't get that virus. Um, we're worried about the people who do have the virus. Pray for the healing of those who already have this. We're concerned about there not being adequate uh, medical facilities and so forth. Pray that, um, that there will be enough medical equipment and staff and hospitals and so forth to treat everybody who has the virus. Um, we're concerned about the policies coming out of our governors and president and, you know, the whole way it's being handled. And um, we'll pray about that. We're concerned about our work, our livelihoods. Pray about these things. Pray for your families. Pray for our community. Pray for everybody who's being affected so deeply by this. And hey, we have time, right? We're all quarantined, uh, quarantined together. Well, get that family together and pray about these very things. In fact, our going to God in prayer about these things can be a profound example to our kids. We want our kids to have joy. We don't want them to be worry warts, sucking all the joy right out of their lives. We want them to be faithful and to come to God. And so let's model that in this situation. Uh, trust God, okay? Trust uh, has a way of crowding out worry and anxiety. Uh, and of course, it crowds out self-sufficient pride too, because when we depend upon God instead of ourselves, that's a burden we don't have to bear ourselves. You know, we use this metaphor of, you know, when you pray to God, you're sort of giving this situation or concern, this burden to him. And you're placing it there in, in his lap. And um, if you worry, it's sort of like you're taking it out of his lap and you're putting it back on your shoulders, essentially, and you're weighing yourself down and burdening yourself with it. We, we want to let God deal with these things according to his plans and purposes and trust him. Um, you may object. Well, but God may not, uh, you know, promise that I won't suffer. God may not protect me. He may not heal me. What if it's not God's will to protect me from this? And that's true. It may not be. Now, here's where I break with some, you know, the prosperity gospel, name it, claim it, blab it, grab it stuff. Um, I do believe God heals. I've seen him heal. I've prayed for healing. I've experienced this healing. I do believe God protects us very often. I believe God has saved my life on a number of occasions. But I don't think the Bible teaches that if you just believe hard enough and don't say the wrong thing, if you just confess the right thing, God will always heal you. I don't think that. I think it's subject to his will. I think we should pray in faith, but faith has more to less to do with making God do what we want and everything to do with 
getting on board with his will. I'm not the sovereign one trying to manipulate God. That's more the magic and occult worldview. The Christian worldview sees God as sovereign. And we, well, we may ask for the right things, the wrong things, good things, bad things. Have no, We may have no idea the results that would occur if our exact requests were answered when and how we wanted them. But God, in his infinite wisdom, he's got the plan. He's the one who knows how to sort all these things out. So we seek his will. Even Jesus, the son in the Garden of Eden, or Garden, Garden of Gethsemane, is praying to the Father, if it be possible, let this cup of suffering on the cross pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. We need to do likewise. We need to be able to pray to God, okay, I, I pray that you would help no one in my family to get the coronavirus, but if they do, I have to be okay with you still. Because there's a long game to be played here. There's the whole issue of eternity and our eternal fate, whether the new creation or the lake of fire. And everything that will happen for untold zillions of years and beyond, an infinity, I mean, just an absolute unlimited eternity of time, of wonderful, the, I mean, the best possible flourishing peace, justice experience you could ever imagine. That will make any suffering we endure on the way to that seem like a blip on the radar. And so we have to play long game in, in essence and not be too hung up on when and how God decides to answer our prayers. We trust him, not just to do what we want, and if he does what we, what we want, but we trust him that he's got the right plans and purposes, and we've got to follow him where he's going. Mary Crowley said, every evening I turn my worries over to God. He's going to be up all night anyway. Oh, better him than us. Better God being concerned with it than you all night long. You'll need your rest. And as you're praying, thank God, count those blessings. I mean, no matter how bad it gets, there's always something to be thankful for. I don't mean to, in saying any of this stuff, minimize what you're going through right now. If you're out of a job and if you're in a vulnerable you know, group to the coronavirus, I mean, and, and you're lonely, I, shut in, I don't minimize that at all. I really encourage you to contact me, contact our church. Let us help you and, and bury your burdens with you. Let's, let's bear each other's burdens because this isn't going to be easy. I just mean to say that, that there are ways to flourish and be at peace within, even when things are not so good without. Now, um, here's a question, though. We're talking about how the eternal future, you know, the resurrection, the new creation, eternity, all that stuff is going to make things worthwhile. But is there any present benefit to trusting God in a situation like this? And Paul actually gives us a little something here, Philippians 4, 7. He says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God's peace will guard your heart. Well, from what? about all that fear and worry and anxiety we've been talking about. Th those things can control you and, again, rob you of your joy and strength. God is like a fortress with walls higher and thicker and stronger than any you've ever seen in a German castle or any imagined fortress that Hollywood has ever presented to us. If God decides that he is going to protect you and your family from COVID-19, no force in hell or earth could change that. You are secure because God makes you secure. He is our refuge. He is our fortress and our rock. And then it says that the peace of God that surpasses understanding is what's going to guard our hearts and minds. Well, just in case 
we don't understand what it means to have a piece that surpasses understanding. Let's just explain it like this. Imagine that you don't have any faith in God, that you're agnostic, you, you know, oh, I don't know if there's a God or not, or atheist, I don't believe in God, or um, nuns, the, the many people in our society who now say we have, you know, they have no religious affiliation. Let's say you're just totally skeptical about resurrection, afterlife, all that kind of stuff. And so you think that once people die, boom, you're extinct, your consciousness um, ends, and that's that, okay? Well, when, and let's say that you have coronavirus and, you know, a, a weakened immune system and you can't get access to the cure or whatever. They're working on experimental cures now, but let's just say that you are laying in bed dying of this thing. You know that the best days of your life are behind you. That is what you're feeling. You're not feeling hopeful about better days in the future because your belief system says you have no future. You will literally die without hope. Now contrast that with we who know that God is real. We know what God has promised those who are faithful to him. We know that God has promised the world to come and the resurrection of the dead. That though our souls will, you know, sort of separate from the body and the body decay for a time at death, and our souls will go into kind of a, an intermediate waiting room phase in heaven, comforted greatly in God's presence. Yet the ultimate hope of the Christian is the resurrection and the renewal of all things, the physical body being reunited with the soul, being perfected in the image of Christ, literally looking at the face, the literal eyeballs of Jesus Christ as we stare at him, eyeball to eyeball, and walk with him in the physical and renewed transformed creation. Now, I know some of that doesn't sound like the gospel preached in way too many evangelical churches. Too many evangelical churches give this sort of platonic view of, you know, the soul leaving the body behind and good riddance to leaving the world behind and going on to heaven forever. And who cares about the physical body in the world? It's all just going to be annihilated anyway, or some such thing. That is not the hope of the Christian. Read Romans 8 more carefully. You'll see it. It's a, uh, the creation groans as in the pains of childbearing, waiting to be liberated from its bondage to decay. Not waiting to be destroyed, annihilated, never to come back. Waiting for liberation from the curse that God put on the world in Genesis 3. And you read Isaiah 65 and 66, it speaks of the new creation. It says new heavens and new earth, but it doesn't mean heaven, heaven like with word of God is. It means a new universe, the transformed universe based on Romans 8. And then you read the last three chapters of the Bible and you've got the resurrection of the dead, physical bodies, immortal. And then you've got the transformation into the new creation in the last two chapters of the Bible. And then if you really look at those chapters carefully, you see where the end is like the beginning. Uh, Gen uh, Revelation 21 and 22 continually echoes Genesis 1, 2, and 3 to say that God is reestablishing um, that sort of uh, way of being except projecting forward into the future with all that has been accomplished. We're not going to set technology back to zero, but it is, because uh, there will be cities and so forth, but it is going to be a renewed and physical creation. It is going to be justice. It's going to be peace. It's going to be unity, full human flourishing, no more wars, no dying, no crying, no pain, no disease, no coronavirus, none of that stuff. That's what we look forward to. So in that light, if you're dying as a person who has faith in the Lord, if you've got the coronavirus, your physical death in this world, though tragic, though it'll be mourned, it's not something to be 
so afraid of, it's not the end of the world. So we don't fear death, okay? Remember, worry is as useless as a handle on a snowball. I want to take a few minutes and I want to pray. And um, I, in fact, I just want to lead you in a prayer about many of the very things that we've been talking about, how we need to pray about. So let's just take a few moments and pray about this entire coronavirus situation together. And let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you with all of our concerns. And Lord, in doing so, we can keep those concerns from becoming worry. We can keep it from becoming paralyzing fear and anxiety. Lord, we want to cast our cares on you for you care for us. And we come to you about this coronavirus, Lord, that's been spreading all over our world. We want to pray, first of all, for those who are sick with this disease, for their healing, Lord. Protect them and help them to survive this. We pray, Father, for the stopping of the spread of this disease. We pray that you would bring a stop to this thing. Um, Lord, uh, we pray that you give wisdom to our authorities to figure out the very best ways to protect people and combat the virus, Lord, um, and to, to, to mobilize the resources needed to treat people. We pray for the medical uh, field right now. Lord, doctors and nurses and medical professionals are up to their eyeballs. They are working so hard. Lord, renew their strength. Give them wisdom. Give them energy and give them the, everything they need to treat people. Um, give the more inventive among us wisdom about how to cure this virus and, um, and others how to um, form some sort of vaccine that'll immunize people from this. Uh, we pray for the economic impact, Lord. People need to earn a living so they can eat and live and, you know, get medical care and everything else. Um, and Lord, there are people who are losing their jobs or having um, hours cut back over this, and it's going to make it very tight and tough to make ends meet. We pray that you would help this not to destroy um, pe people's ability to support themselves and their family here and around the world. We pray, Lord, um, for, for some sort of economic um, help. We also pray that it wouldn't come at the cost of um, unmanageable debt for this country. Um, give our leaders wisdom about all these matters, we pray. We pray for our church, Lighthouse Assembly of God, Lord. We pray that you would keep the virus away from us and Curry County. So far, we don't think there are any cases here. Well, we pray that, um, again, uh, that, that it would not come here. We pray, Lord, that we would look out for each other, loving our neighbor as ourselves, bearing each other's burdens, and so fulfilling the law of Christ. Help us, Lord, to encourage each other, Lord. Um, give us joy, give us strength, and help us to approach this thing, uh, you know, with seriousness on the one hand, and yet with a an unquenchable joy because we know you and we've got your great and precious promises to look forward to. Help us to handle this in such a way that we give hope and encouragement to the people around us. Help us to help our community as well. We pray, Lord, all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening in today. I'll have another video up on Sunday. God bless all of you.